Shavi, over to you. Namaste and good evening, everyone. I, Chavi Kapoor, researcher at IMPRI Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Evamniti Anusandhan Sansthan, Nay Dilli, extend my heartiest welcome to you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we are here for a special talk on gender and mental health by Dr. Minu Anand. This discussion is a part of our series, The State of Gender Equality, hashtag gender gaps, organized by IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center. We are very grateful to have Professor Vibhuti Patel to chair this session. Ma'am is an eminent economist and feminist and former professor at Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Welcome, ma'am. We are delighted to be joined by Dr. M. Manjula, Professor Smita Deshpande, Dr. Koteshwara Rao, Professor Nilima Shivastav, Dr. Varudhini Kankipati, and Dr. Ananya Mahapatra as discussants. With the permission of our chair, I would like to introduce our speaker for today. Go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Minu Anand is a faculty with the Department of Social Work, University of Delhi, with ex extensive professional experience and exposure in the area of gender and mental health. Formerly with Women's Studies and Development Center, University of Delhi, she has also taught at Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar College, University of Delhi. Dr. Anand has been actively involved in working on issues related to gender, mental health, and education for more than two decades. She has been instrumental in development of curriculum at the postgraduate level on gender for Women's Studies and Development Center, University of Delhi, and has a vast publication in the form of books as well as research papers in national and international journals that seek to highlight issues related to gender, mental health, and social work within interdisciplinary frameworks. She is passionate about working and researching on gender and mental health. Thank you for accepting our invitation, ma'am. It would be my pleasure to introduce our discussions for today. Dr. M. Manjula is a professor of clinical psychology at Department of Clinical Psychology at National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. Professor Smita Deshpande is a professor and senior consultant at Center of Excellence in Mental Health, APVIMS, Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia Hospital, New Delhi. Dr. Koteshwara Rao is assistant director of Schizophrenia Research Foundation, India, he is also a member of the State Mental Health Authority, Government of Tamil Nadu. Professor Nilima Shivastav is a professor at School of Gender and Development Studies at Indira Gandhi National Open University. Dr. Varudini Kankipati is the co-founder of Interconnect Telangana. Dr. Ananya Mahapatra is a special consultant and head of Department of Psychiatry at, <clears throat> at ESIC Hospital, Delhi. She is a former assistant professor at Center of Excellence in Mental Health at Dr. Ram Manohar Lohia Hospital. I'd like to extend our warmest welcome to the discussions. I now invite Professor Vibhuti Patel, our chair, to give the opening remarks and invite our panelists and uh, invite our discussions for the session. Thank you, ma'am. Over to you. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. First of all, like uh, I would like to thank Dr. Arjun Kumar for giving us this opportunity for such an important discussion on gender and mental health. Uh, the Dr. Meenu Anand, she's uh, Dr. Professor Nilima Shivastav, Dr. M. Manjula, Professor Smita Deshpande, Dr. Koteshwar Rao, Dr. Rudini Kankipati, and esteemed participants. Good evening. And I would like to well, I feel honored to be part of this panel discussion by uh, IMPRI uh, team and also providing, which IMPRI team has provided us the platform for this think tank, uh, Impact Policy and uh, Research Institute for this important book discussion on edited, pub uh, edited publication by Springer Nature titled Gender and Mental Health, Combining Theory and Practice. Though we are going to focus on gender and mental health, but I think what got, got motivated to for this uh, discussion, mainly because recently the publication by Springer has come out, which is edited by uh, Dr. Mino Anand. According to World Health Organization, among the most important contributors to global burden of disease and disability are mental health problems. Mental health and neurological conditions account for 12.3% of disability adjusted life years, GALIs, uh, lost globally, and 31% of all years lived with disability at all ages and in both sexes, according to uh, the year 2000. 
estimates. This mind-boggling universal reality gets more accentuated for women in the developing countries of Asia, Africa, and Latin America due to economic hardship and traditional gender norms. Differential gender implications due to socially constructed roles and responsibilities, entitlements and citizenship rights, sociocultural status and political power uh, profoundly interact with biological differences between different genders, uh, contribute differentially to the nature of mental health problems suffered, health seeking behavior of those affected and responses of the health sector and society. Mental health challenges of lesbian, gays, bisexual, transgender, queer, intersex, and asexual uh, communities, persons with disabilities, sex workers get accentuated due to societal prejudices and social exclusion from developmental needs such as education, health, career, shelter, and space in the civil society as citizens. Mental health issues of women are gaining ground in the social science discourses in India. Feminist theorization has challenged, on the one hand, misogyny of Freud and neo-Freudian and social Darwinists. Uh, on the other, feminist analysis has also challenged the universalist ethic approach. This approach is found limiting in dealing with the mental health problems. Amic approach that emphasizes cross-cultural psychiatry and evaluates mental health condition of women and all the marginalized sections from uh, within a culture is found more useful. Worsening socioeconomic and political situation has enhanced rates of common mental health disorders and minor psychiatric problem uh, and uh, morbidity also, psychiatric morbidity. Trauma caused by violence against women demands support that is non-threatening to their psychological and physiological well-being. Women's movement has provided fresh inputs in terms of individual and group counseling, popularly known as consciousness raising exercise, a form of mutual counseling that enables women as a group to share experiences, problems, feelings, dreams, utopia, and action plan for rebuilding shattered lives. This process of attaining feminist consciousness allows women to recognize that what they perceive as personal problems are shared with others in a non-threatening and non-power oriented atmosphere. It also enables women to realize what they think of as, as a result uh, of uh, living in a patriarchal society. Consciousness raising can be seen as enabling all the uh, victims or the survivors of violence to overcome false consciousness. It empowers them to come to the realization of their own potential, makes them autonomous, self-dependent in the decision-making power and emotionally self-reliant. It is an ongoing process that brings about personal and collaborative change as opposed to structural change. The need for small groups and informal group discussion is emphasized in this method. LGBTQIA plus communities have also created the self-help groups for collective empowerment with the slogan ek or ek gyara. That means one plus one is equal to 11. When you are isolated, you are disempowered, you are brutalized, you are excommunicated, you are uh, at the receiving end of the system. When you get united, you empower each other. And li it limits the uh, negative elements and it uh, multiplies the positive uh, energy. With this backdrop, today we are, we are discussing uh, Dr. Mino Anand's path-breaking edited volume, Gender and Mental Health, Combining Theory with Practice. The discussions are also exposed both theoretically and in terms of practical experiences. First of all, we would request uh, uh, Dr. Minu Anand from Department of Social Works, University of Delhi to make a 15 minutes presentation uh, uh, to give the overview. And after that, we turn to the expert panelists. Over to Dr. Minwan. Very good evening to everybody. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Professor Patel. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Arjun Kumar, uh, for giving me this wonderful opportunity to speak on the issue that is closest to my heart, gender and mental health. Uh, mental health is gendered. The theme of gender and mental health has emerged as an important traversing treatise in the contemporary socio-cultural ethos of our society. Particularly at this time, when we are all reeling under the pandemic, 
have been under acute stress for more than a year. Our mental health has been impacted. I strongly feel that as a critical socio-cultural determinant of mental health, gender needs significant attention in promotion and protection of mental health and fostering resilience among people. While I share my perspective on the theme, I feel that anything related to mental health has to begin from ourselves, how we feel as women, as men, or as the other. There is also an intricate enmeshment between gender and mental health. I would also like to add here that I'm a social worker by profession, and when I conceptualize gender, I view the term as a composite whole, comprising of men and women and persons with alternate sexualities. I would like to divide this conversation on gender and mental health into three broad domains. Number one, I will be beginning of, uh, with a discussion on gender and mental health from a psychosocial perspective. Number two, I would be briefly sharing gender trends with respect to mental illness. And I will be concluding this conversation by sharing about my humble academic attempt in the form of my book. So uh, friends, uh, I would like to begin with my first key point that is mental health from a gender perspective. Mental health, we all know, is a pursuit towards attaining dignity, belongingness, control, and purposefulness in our life, and it is way beyond mental illness. I'm a strong believer in the biopsychosocial approach where I like to give a lot of significance to the social and environmental aspects of mental health. I feel that the way I conceive my mental health includes not only my individual biological attributes like my hormones, my chemical balances, my neurons, but also my self-concept, my sense of autonomy, reality perception, and also environmental mastery. I also feel strongly that a lot of these were ingrained in me during my socialization as there have been tremendous impact of psychosocial factors and I do give a lot of trust on gender. So how I perceive myself today as a woman, as a teacher, as a mother, as a wife, my self-concept, my confidence, my entire persona, my do's and don'ts, how I behave, how I manage my interpersonal relationships, they all have been indeed governed by gendered socialization. And this also holds true for each one of us, for men, women, and persons with alternate sexualities. What I mean to say is that entire being that we have, what we are today, is influenced and governed by our socio-cultural environment and therefore it is extremely important to keep the gender perspective in our minds. And gender does not mean only men or women or the other, but it's also about, we know, power and powerlessness. It is about masculinity and femininity and the complex interplay between these analytical categories. Gender influences the power and control people have over the determinants of mental health, for example, socioeconomic position, roles, ranks, access and control over resources. And here we know that culture plays a very important role in the conception of gender and gender practices. For example, men still primarily retain the key responsibility for it providing economic support in the family, whereas women are still responsible for caregiving roles, nurturing roles, and even domestic work even if they are employed. Girls are still being socialized to acquire the dominant form of femininity and are encouraged to develop traits like being nurturing, supportive, emotionally expressive, tolerant, compromising, passive, warm, and accepting a subordinate status in marriage and employment. Competitiveness, assertiveness, anger, violence are totally unfeminine. Similarly, boys are encouraged to develop dominant conceptions of masculinity, which we call as hegemonic masculinity, and are told to be bold, competitive, assertive, independent, ambitious, confident, tough, and even violent to some extent, because these are the traits which are considered very important to have success in the labor market. They are expected to avoid characteristics related to femininity, for example, crying. Men are not supposed to cry, and because it makes them less macho. Gender socialization, my dear friends, therefore has a direct impact on one's acquisition and development of self an understanding of social roles and responsibilities, and it definitely shapes and impacts mental health of an individual. Thus, gender is not an attribute that we possess by birth, 
but it is something which we all have acquired by doing through reinforcements and through modeling. Gender affects many aspects of life, including access to resources, inculcated methods of coping with stress, styles of interacting with others, self-evaluations, behavioral patterns, and our expectations of others. Plus, there are also factors, for example, poverty, caste, class, available opportunities, migration, refugee status, abuse, crime, violence, pandemics like these, and the larger consequences of globalization, which impact the risk and vulnerability of a person with respect to mental health. I now move on to the second point that I wish to make, and that is sharing some brief uh, information and trends with respect to mental illness from a gendered lens. There are diverse perspectives on mental illness in India, including the notions of Booth, Churel, Nazar, and uh, one quite debate, you know, we debate about what quite is normal, you know, and what actually is mental illness. We usually have a very biomedical approach uh, towards mental illness, where we give a lot of importance to genetics, chemical imbalances, brain abnormalities. I also strongly feel that there is a lot of medicalization, a lot of psychiatricization of mental health issues. Any and every mood swing, even mild OCD, sleep disturbance, or any deviance from the so-called normal is often linked to a disorder based on ICD or DSM classifications. And according to research-based trends, men and women experience different varieties of mental health problems. Women exceed men in internalizing disorders, for example, depression, anxiety, whereas men exhibit more externalizing disorders, for example, substance abuse, antisocial behavior. WHO has clearly said that women are twice as likely as men to develop depression during their lifetime. If we look at the data from the National Mental Health Survey of India to 2016, it shows that there is a clear male predominance in alcohol use disorders and for bipolar affective disorders. Similarly, when we talk about specific mental disorders like anxiety disorders, uh, agoraphobia or neurosis, OCD, there is a female predominance. And gender also uh, plays a very important role when we think of stigma associated with mental illness, access to treatment, continuation of the treatment, and most importantly, rehabilitation of persons with mental illness. So trying to summarize my point one and point two, it is gender that determines the differential power and control people have over various aspects of life, social position, status, treatment in society, opportunities that make them vulnerable and susceptible to mental health risks, treatment, as well as rehabilitation. A gendered approach to mental health, therefore, is going to analyze the interconnections as well as interactions across the biopsychosocial factors and also uh, being sensitive to how gender inequality affects health outcomes. Uh, may I request uh, Dr. Arjun to please share the screen? Uh, I now come uh, to the third and the final part of this conversation. Um, the subject uh, of gender has always intrigued me in the last 25 years of my professional career as a woman and as a feminist scholar. Over the years, during the course of my research and teaching, I have developed a very strong passion for exploring many contours and sub-themes related to gender. As my own life evolved through varied phases comprising of happiness, elation, challenges, turmoils, I steadily actually began to question what is normal. I tried to explore myself, my own relationships, their contexts, and also realize how deeply they were all embedded within me. My personal journey also led me to various academic discourses with my students, and from there, a new idea and a new dream was born a few years back. I came across a lot of wonderful research studies and papers on gender and mental health. However, I could not locate a recent textbook exclusively focusing on gender and mental health. And this 
led to the inception of my book, Gender and Mental Health, which has been published by Springer Nature Singapore. I had a very, very strong passion to put together an integration of schemas on mental health from an eclectic perspective. And being a social work educator and a scholar of gender studies, I strongly believe in praxis between theory and practice. And no discourse on theory, any discussion on my classroom, it's all the time, you know, only gets complete when there is an amalgamation between theory and practice, which means field-based narratives have to be there. So my book is actually a humble attempt to bring together models, approaches, on mental health by professionals from multiple disciplines, social workers, medical practitioners, lawyers, academicians, with a strong thrust on voices from the grassroots. It's actually an amalgamation of academic as well as grassroots realities on the theme, and it seeks to explore and document the inclusion of practice-based interventions, which I strongly feel is the need of the art. The book, can you go to the next slide, please? The book is comprising of three parts. The first part focuses on conceptual underpinnings for gender and mental health. The part two talks about the mental health scenario in India from a gender lens. And the third and the final part talks about the grassroots realities. Uh, can, can we go to the next slide, please? Uh, as you can see, uh, dear friends, part one is setting to uh, talk about critical foundation it's talking about what actually is mental health, the basic concepts, models, and approaches, in addition to a cross-cultural perspective on the theme. Move on to the next slide, please. Part two delineates the entire scenario of mental health in the Indian context. There is an excellent paper by our stalwart Professor Aris Murthy on hashtag MeToo movement, women and disability, a paper on women and schizophrenia by Professor Smita Deshpande and Dr. Aranya Mahapatra. Uh, both of them are here as experts, a paper on holistic concerns in urban areas by our Madam Chairperson, Professor Vibhuti Patel, plus a paper to explain the legal standpoint. Can I move on to the request you to move on to the next please? Part three is actually, um, I think making the book more special and unique because it covers voices from the field. We all know about the efforts by the Banyan, Tarasha, which is a TIS project, Mehak Foundation in the field of mental health. So the third part of the book uh, has various chapters which are talking about the experiences from the grassroots and covering issues related to domestic violence, homelessness, criminality, and also the whole narrative about psychosocial rehabilitation. I have been extremely fortunate to have received so much encouragement, so much support from the stalwarts in the field, Professor Aris Murthy, Professor Smita Deshpande, Dr. Bhargavi Dawar, Professor Dilima Srivastava, Professor Matra, Professor Bhatia, Professor Roy, Professor Gopi Kumar, Dr. Lakshmi, and of course our dear, dear chairperson, Professor Dubuti Patel. And I am so grateful, so humbled, and so thankful for them for having trusted me, for putting in their so much faith in me, you know, when I approached them a few years back. Can I move to the request to move on to the next slide, please? So the book is unique because it hopes to achieve a just start. Uh, it's based on a biopsychosocial approach. There is a combination of theory plus practice. It is also, I'm hoping, going to be useful for faculty, students of social work, sociology, social policy, women and gender studies, social psychiatry, psychology. And I also hope that it is going to be used as a reference material in the curriculum for students as well as useful for professionals in the field of mental health, whether it's social work, nursing, uh, medicine, psychology, legal uh, people from the legal background. And I think even persons who are battling with the personal experience of having a mental disorder or they are members uh, of the family, of the person who is uh, going through difficult phase, it can help them as well. So to conclude my talk, I feel that what mental health actually needs is more explicit candor, unashamed conversations about our thoughts, our feelings. What we really need is promotion of well-being across the sexes, 
nurturing children as human beings not as girls not as boys we need to have a synergy across various disciplines with trust on bio psycho social approach greater allocation of course on resources towards mental health reducing the stigma through individual family community based programs thank you so much thank you dr minu anand for giving such an overarching understanding and also talking about the socio cultural and economic determinants of gender and also the risk and vulnerabilities uh, which are created uh, which are created by the complex social reality i very much like your critique of a biomedical approach and over medicalization and uh, how bio psychosocial approach is very important for any kind of intervention and uh, now i turn to professor nila shivastav who has co-authored the first chapter and she has been uh, she has a long association with women's studies she was in delhi university women's studies center and she she was a director of uh, school of gender and development studies as a women's studies scholar how do you see the importance of uh, 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 this uh, question of a mental health and also the kind of uh, direction in which the researches have to go over to dr nilima shivastav uh thank you so much uh, professor vibhuti uh, patel for giving me the opportunity to open the discussion as a discussant uh, for this very very uh, interesting and important event in today's uh, scenario so uh, i would at the onset i would like to compliment impri for coming up with an event of this kind as it will certainly boost the morale of young authors a discussion and attention of academia in coming up with scholarly documentations of issues related to gender and mental health is the need of the art especially as just uh, uh, shared with you by my dear friend and the editor of the book in the wake of the present pandemic that has resulted in long periods of lockdown work from home for more than an year and students faced with online classes or laptop school as my four year old daughter calls it the book titled gender and mental health combining theory and practice edited by dr minu anand is an exemplary effort to put together interdisciplinary perspectives on mental health from diverse areas that complement conceptual understanding and theory with lived experiences of everyday life and field based interventions the central idea of the book is that mental health is gendered and a gendered approach to mental health implies distinguishing between biological and social factors just highlighted by dr anand and also exploring their interconnections and by being sensitive to the prevalent gender in inequality of all as all these can influence health outcomes of women and girls especially dr anand further asserts that sex as a category is relevant for understanding and treatment of mental disorders but as a researcher it is important to include gender lens from the inception of the study design to analysis and interpretation also to understand the etiology and while devising a treatment plan for mental disorders or while promoting mental well being practitioners have to factor in gender differentials also as uh, again minu highlighted and discussed the importance of factoring in gender socialization of girls and boys in our society similarly researchers have 
to go beyond gender based analysis and inter interpretation and should also come up with gender based recommendations which are generally found that are generally not found while formulating the uh, recommendations further the service providers and researchers have to look beyond sex and gender binaries and deconstruct these fluid notions to be act, to be effective in teaching and practice and for enhancing mental health of everyone so that they can bring about real change at the societal level the book very importantly questions the notion of normality further throwing light on how complex is the understanding of mental health and which is much beyond absence of mental illness or mental disorders therefore the boundary between mental health and mental illness is a contested idea of normalcy that is socially constructed and widely accepted dr anand thus proposes to deconstruct the fixed boundaries of them and us to give an idea about the organization of the book as has been already done by dr anand but i will give you my own understanding of how the book has been organized it is an amalgamation of, of academic inquiry and experiential reflections on the themes of gender and mental health combining both theoretical discourses and field based interventions highlighting challenges faced and success stories that emerged out of these experiments most chapters in the book delineate complex intertwining of mental illness and cultural expectations and cultural constructions in some uncharted areas about which i will talk in the subsequent seg segment of my discussion the book is divided in three sections that can be thematically categorized as understanding what entails medical uh, mental health then examining through a feminist perspective or a feminist lens and the last as meenu hai just shared is compilation of interventions that have taken at the grassroots the first section which have five ch chapters deal with building conceptual understanding of gender and mental health by looking at multifaceted theoretical framework which is what i wanted to emphasize here that the theoretical frameworks have been from very very uh, interesting and diversified uh, you know perspectives have been used to look at mental health framework then what are the factors affecting mental illnesses and mental health out outcomes and how it is important to understand varied notions of mental health that involves going beyond the defined categories in the second section uh, dr anand has put together five chapters that addresses contemporary mental health issues that bog our society namely sexual harassment at workplace disability from an intersectionality approach then interlinkages between gender and schizophrenia then how exigencies of urban life impact mental health especially of women and how female criminality and its treatment is seen by the criminal law the third section has collection of six chapters which meenu has discussed in detail and they are all based on the interventions cutting across themes and approaches on a personal note as a contributor to this volume i express my heartfelt thanks to my colleague and dear friend dr meenu anand who strongly persuaded me to be part of this erudite academic journey published by springer singapore 
and I express my appreciation for Meenu Anand for hand holding and polishing the chapter that we have co authored. Lastly, as an academician and as a researcher, I can say that this book that holistically looks at diverse issues related to gender and mental health shall be useful for students at different levels. May it be uh, at the UG level where they have to understand the concept and the theoretical favor of mental health as at postgraduate level, they may find it useful when we look at the, diff the diverse uh, uh, the, and the, uh, the diverse uh, uh, contours of uh, looking at mental health in different settings. And as teachers, it can be used both at UG level, PG level, or at the level of research when looking at gender, when looking at mental health from a gender perspective. The book is also uh, very, very useful for practitioners and researchers in their academic pursuit. So with this, I congratulate Dr. Meenu Anand for coming up with a very important and the contemporary uh, issue that the whole world is facing. And it is said that after pandemic, there may be a pandemic. So the mental health has to be ensured at all level by all sections of society, by the citizens, as well as by the state agents and also the non-state actors. I thank uh, Impri and the chair for giving me this opportunity to share my thoughts about the book. Thank you so much. Thank you. Professor Nalima Desh, uh, Desh, uh, Srinivasan for such a erudite and uh, very uh, focused presentation in such a short span of time where you examine right from etiology to epistemology of the gendered mental health concerns. And I think how we have to be disaster preparedness we have to show uh, for the pandemic. So now I would like to ask Professor Deshpande for uh, her, uh, uh, her, her ideas about schizophrenia and uh, whether schizophrenia is socially determined or there is something biological. So are you, uh, what are your understandings about schizophrenia in our country? Um, Over to Dr. Nishpan. Good evening, Professor Patel. And thank you very much for inviting me for this uh, very excellent panel. And I see that there is a huge, uh, uh, audience already within this Zoom meeting itself, as well as I understand that this panel has gone live on the Facebook as well. So it is obvious that this is a, a topic which is close to the hearts of uh, at least social scientists all over the country and perhaps all over the world. And unfortunately, no matter what uh, uh, Minu says about gender, the most disadvantaged gender unfortunately remains the female gender. And this has been true down the ages. This has been true across all socioeconomic status. Uh, and um, to some extent, I do agree with uh, Minu that at least a part of the disadvantaged uh, minority in, uh, in those with mental problems has been the woman because she has been less understood and perhaps uh, as uh, uh, Professor Patel, you yourself talked about uh, the Freudian perspective, that shadow still looms large over our scientists. In fact, when we look at research studies in psychiatry, in any psychiatric field, women are usually the smaller group. The women are the less studied. For any new drug, women with, who are pregnant or best breastfeeding are specifically excluded. Because under the uh, heading of, you know, being safe to the fetus and so on. But what actually happens is that the drug gets marketed. It is used across the field. And just like everybody else, pregnant and uh, nursing women are also exposed to it. So right from the time that the mental health, uh, the mental health problem manifests itself to bringing the woman for treatment, 
to ensuring that she gets the adequate treatment to the fact of uh, rehabilitation, uh, pregnancy, uh, children, uh, etc. Uh, the woman does get disadvantaged. Let's face it. To some extent, the gendered others are in a similar boat, but they are in the position of being able to sometimes hide their preferences, which women obviously cannot do. In the same way, in uh, serious mental disorders, uh, serious, severe depression is a serious mental disorder, and Dr. Uh, our eminent speakers have already talked about it, that depression is much more common amongst women than in men. In the same way, there were some thoughts about women with schizophrenia being protected and being less ill and so on, which looking at the biological basis, there is a biological basis to this disorder, seem unlikely. However, as far as the outcomes are concerned, as far as the social disadvantageness is concerned, mentally women are at the bottom, mentally ill women, seriously mentally ill women are really at the bottom of the heap and they are often rejected. They are often uh, discarded. Uh, they may be cast off or even within the family, they may be excluded or cornered. So those are some of my thoughts. Of course, it's a very vast field and I, I can go on endlessly, but I'll stop here and say that it is a truth. Of course, it is also a truth that at least some part of the, the manifestation of uh, symptoms of mental illnesses are biological in nature. There are demonstrated changes, group changes within the brain, but there is also a large social overlay. So we need to tease out that social overlay and thus get down to the biological essentials for women so that the, we can actually uh, intervene for the social factors and thus reduce the disadvantageousness that our mentally ill women face. Very Good. important perspective as a practicing uh, uh, psychiatrist. Uh, now, uh, there, are, there are very in, important responses. Uh, one Satyashri Goswami from, uh, uh, from Tata Institute of Social Sciences, who is also doing her PhD, on mental health issues, uh, she responds by saying that the term, quote unquote, unashamed conversation used by Dr. Anand is very insightful. And if we could unpack that with women, we could do a lot. After that, there are many appreciative responses. Gunjan, Gunjan Chando has said that critical aspects have been covered by Dr. Mino uh, Ma'am and uh, Dr. Nilima uh, Desde. And uh, then uh, Ms. Jain, he says that excellent presentation on gender and mental health. Congratulations to all. Now we would ask uh, Dr. Mahapatra to give her response. And uh, she, she, can she share, because she's also a practicing uh, consultant and head of the Department of Psychiatry. So can you share your experiences and critique of the mainstream theorization in mental health? Good afternoon, ma'am. Good yeah. afternoon to all the esteemed panelists. Thank you so much for inviting me here and giving me an opportunity to be with such a erudite group. Uh, I have had also, uh, thanks to Meenu ma'am and Professor Desh Pandey, I had the privilege to be a part of this excellent publication a very, very relevant and important publication in current time, Gender and Mental Health. And uh, I would like to, uh, what I personally feel is the greatest strength of this book is that it has merged, uh, when we as mental health professionals or medical professionals, we look, look more at biological sex as a medical construct, as a physiological construct. And social scientists, they look at gender as primarily a social construct. But this book sort of fuses both the constructs together and uses gender as a much more layered and much more complicated psychosocial construct, which it is. And it gives uh, importance to all the perspectives, which is a very big strength of this book. Uh, yes, mental health issues are greatly gendered. It is something that is uh, so, that has so much evidence now, it, nobody can really look away from it. And this recent pandemic currently is a big testament to that. Uh, 
as we have seen that from the onset of this pandemic, there has been a, uh, an upsurge of intimate partner violence directed towards the women, especially in developed as well as developing countries. So economic factors are not uh, uh, sort of directing it. it is, it's a global issue, so much so that the United Nations has called it a pandemic within a pandemic or a shadow pandemic. And that we can really, uh, we can understand that this sort of an upsurge of intimate partner violence, it was definitely going to have so many mental health and psychological ramifications and it would probably translate into an upsurge of depression, of anxiety, of PTSD and so on in these women. So whenever there is a psychosocial calamity or a political upheaval, gender is always in the background as a mediating factor and its adverse psychosocial consequences are always gendered. Uh, so it is really, really important and this is probably the most important time when we should talk about gender. Uh, when we talk about mental health and uh, mental health post any sort of a natural or disaster or a man-made disaster situation or a uh, pandemic situation like now. And uh, that way we will be able to uh, factor in this very, very important uh, social determinant whenever we talk about the prevalence of the illness, the manifestations of the illness, and uh, also gear our public health policies and our legislation in order to reduce the barriers to treatment because women not only suffer from adverse consequences, they also have less access to treatment because of, uh, because of the stigma, because of not being able to physically access the treatment uh, avenues, not being able to come out without because of lack of support from the family. We are in a collectivistic society where the family shame and family pride is always given uh, sort of uh, importance over the individual suffering of a woman and often they do not reach the sort of treatment avenues or options which are there. So uh, from both aspects, from how the illness manifest, manifests and how these illness need to be managed, gender is an important uh, variable in the background for both these issues and we need to keep that in mind while uh, framing policies while framing public health uh, measures uh, for people in general and specifically for women. Uh, so that is my current uh, take on this. And I think this, uh, this discussion and this book has come at a very, very opportune moment. And I'm really thankful to be here and be a part of it. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Mahapatra for highlighting the issue of uh, pandemic, uh, within pandemic, shadow pandemic of uh, intimate partner violence. But also, uh, you also touched upon the public health policy, the need for that. The, you talked about accessibility, but I would also like to add affordability because the commercialization of counseling in city like Mumbai, the counselors are charging like 2000 per hour, who can afford? And uh, when it comes to the poverty groups like organizations working in the community, it's only the chemical, they are over drugged. Anytime any working class person, person in the, uh, uh, this thing who can't afford to pay and they go to the uh, municipal or government hospital, what they are given is only uh, high potency uh, 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 drugs. And when they are continuously, they are sleeping, they, they become completely, they are in a vegetative state. No? So I think we need to deal with also the commercialization of mental health uh, uh, facility services and how the public health. And that's why now we, I come to uh, our uh, expert who is working with the public health uh, institution government of uh, Tamil Nadu. And uh, he's, uh, yeah, uh, Mr. Dr. Uh, Koteswara Rao, uh, who is working with the Schizophrenia Research Foundation, uh, State Mental Health Authority of Government of Tamil Nadu. And sir, I would like to know from you that what is with the status, uh, re response of the state uh, uh, to the mental health concerns and what kind of new support structures can we create, community-based support structure or halfway home or uh, any kind of uh, uh, non-threatening uh, and non-chemical based intervention to deal with the mental health issues. Over to Dr. Bishop. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you, Impiri. And thank you, Mino, for presenting an excellent uh, review of the book. And I'm very, very happy. And I, uh, I'm really admired by the reviews by many various panelists. 
and respond and everyone has told about the importance of book and contents of the good and good yeah so tamil nadu state mental authority yes we are just definitely way forward and we are doing a lot of things so i am i am fully working with scarp and also part of the state mental authority government of tamil nadu yeah there are actually when you ask about these half a homes or sheltered homes everything has got its own merits the only thing is we are most of the time we are only doing as a trial base and it's not a, accessible to many people you you told me madam about this affordability i am also talking about next level is accessibility because awareness and uh, accessibility affordability are three important yes very, very important in mental health okay and many people are not aware of many things actually because awareness is very very less in mental about mental health and that too in the rural areas is very very less and also the second thing as was is now that accessibility how near they are to you though tamil nadu is the number one in they uh, they district mental health program almost all districts all 31 districts i we can i can say 100% of the districts in tamil nadu has got a district mental health program no doubt about that but how again how will they reach to their place and was there any ambulance services to pick them from the uh, from that uh, residence to the treatment center and go back and how many hospitals beds are there and is that if there is a beds are available definitely there yes but it is affordable is is accessible to these people who are having mental illness that to women so so there, there is lot of gaps are there definitely we all know about actually uh, internationally there is mental health gaps are there and especially in developing countries like india definitely we have lot of gaps and that to in a rural india definitely yes and the tamil nadu is since actually scarf is working for the past 37 years i am working on massive with scarf for the past 25 years plus and with my experience working with community mental health yes there are lot of gaps is there as i told you these three a's awareness starts with awareness accessibility and all these things and tamil nadu state mental health authority uh, is doing lot of things actually we trying to see that actually how we can able to reduce the gap you know reduce the gap in mental health and by increasing the service providers and also uh, there is a ppp model a private public partnership model so how will you no know, because all the time actually we, can, we cannot only blame the government uh, government for anything and everything there are many good ngos are there and tying up with their hands in fact you know very well about uh, in tamil nadu banyan is doing very good things and especially working with the wandering mentally so the wandering mentally ill are the highly ignored i also wanted to add so there are some uh, activists are there in this group and very good uh, professors also there and we all need to keep in mind that actually women with mental health issues there are a lot of gaps is there and less priority is given to mental health uh, among women and one more important thing is the uh, women with mental illness uh, wandering in the streets has got lot of vulnerability no uh, in fact actually uh, dr kishor kumar from bani also one of the time was mentioning actually uh, 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 8 out of 10 you know when you see them actually sexually abused on the streets so there should be actually the policy at the state level at the national level also to reduce the risk uh, vulnerability among these uh, uh, wandering mentally ill that is in fact my area of interest also though i work with scarf and actually we are <laughs> scarf is also trying to see that actually wherever possible we are trying to raise voice for these people who have been unvoiced unheard their voice the voices are highly unheard uh, because uh, they this will couldn't able to tell and in fact actually we can see in tamil nadu most of the times we are seeing only from people from north india and tamil nadu we are all underprivileged and we don't know the language in fact i i i i'm also running on institution actually where i must part of that i have got actually 22 boys are there they're all actually speaking some of those speaking hindi some i don't even know what language they speak and we must have some kind of centralized system to reunite back these people who are wandering in the streets okay i can i can probably take a photograph from say one person in one state i can reuniting okay there are a lot of issues like this are happening and the state the central government also must allocate sufficient funds to the respective states because i am telling you know, 100% in tamil nadu it is dhp is functioning but still there are a lot of gaps are there what will happen to the states which is does not have such a facility in especially north north india north india in india so we are finding it so we if uh, sufficient facilities are there and we can if they will be very happy for example uh, other day i found in bar in the streets so i used to carry some two or three packets of food in my car and i was giving i gave with them the uh, food and he saw that actually some thai sadam and sambar sadam and he was not very happy second day i told my wife why don't you prepare some chapati and take the moment he saw the chapati he was very very happy to see that to take it also 
So what I'm trying to tell is that there are a lot of things actually. In fact, Vanian has brought up a lot of issues related to that, and uh, we must actually carry with all these things and uh, centralize the information has to be there available in a centralized way and all the states must uh, allocate sufficient funds to look after this wandering mentally ill and especially people women with the mental illness who was wandering in the states these are the very very important aspects which, which i wanted to cover in this study and i also have i requested that the organizers to share my slides which is there and that actually yeah. i have two slides only i if you permit the chair i request the chair to permit me to take two slides uh, to share with you all right we are ready sir we are being bring it down and we in in my uh, hometown ranchi we also have central institute of psychiatry okay. uh, but that's in ranchi but it's a very valid point you have raised that some centralized system must be there because yes, this need anywhere sir uh, the slides are on over to you yeah thank you very much for adding that point yes yeah so I have got actually a few learnings from what Ashley Scarf is doing in the mental health, especially with the women, Ashley. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So women in mental health. So not so good news is because the duration of untreated psychosis is called as DUP, is higher in women in rural areas than compared to urban areas. Because they take long time to reach the place. Women generally tend to seek medical help very late, then men in the house and children always get a preference. Once treatment is begun, actually, in fact, this very good news is that there seem to have adherence is better among women than compared to men. And the poverty related mental health issues, in fact, actually, that uh, uh, Bino also brought up that actually the poverty related mental health issues in women is very high. Many women who develop severe mental illness after marriage are sent back to their parental homes for get treated. Once the man is affected after the marriage, you know, it has been blamed only the woman is getting blamed. I'm sure some of you may be aware of that. Okay, many times the result is separation. In fact, this is also done in one study is called a SCARF NCW study. Alimony is rarely given to their support, uh, to their support uh, and look after the children also. The stay of women is residence centers. In fact, in fact SCARF is running three residence centers for, uh, for persons suffering with mental illness. In the centers, what we tend to see is that they tend to see a Long term used to stay, the woman used to stay because the family members or husbands is uh, uh, reluctant to take them back home. And the elderly parents are most worried about the future of their daughters with severe mental illnesses. So who is after me? Who is going to take care of uh, after us? That is what is the question, which always I got. And they many times will come and cry in front, in front of us. No, some of them would have done. In fact, we used to help them actually by telling them, you know, put them in a residence centers and try to transfer your uh, uh, pension, things like that is the recent thing is there. But again, there are a lot of issues are there with that. I'm sure some of you who are working with that area also may know aware of those things. Next slide, please. Yeah. So we also take actually women as the community level worker, as a facilitator is good news. Because uh, in fact, actually, for the past 25 years, and this car is doing a lot of things in the community mental health. And women make every uh, very effective way as a, uh, working as community level worker for many health issues, including mental health. So why they are, uh, they are, we have selected the woman is because they seem to have a natural empathy towards the person who is sick, maybe mental illness or any, any other illness also. Community accepts them better and they're happy to let them into their houses also. When, so for example, if you send them a man, for the field work, you know, they are most of the time they will say no, no, but because no woman will be around there and they may not be culturally, they will not be actually uh, allowing them inside actually. Yeah. And most importantly, they are all, most of them are from the same community and same locality. We take them and we recruit the people from the same village or same panchayat at least. Okay. Many of them are already involved in some kind of community-based activities. Those who are already working, you know, there are a lot of government programs, ASHA, uh, ASHA workers, and also there are uh, Puduwaru, Tittam, DNSR alum, a lot of activities are going on in Tamil Nadu. In that, if they already work in that area, and we also try to uh, see, uh, see them, whether we can recruit them also. So recently, also about actually two years back, SCARF has signed an MOU with the Women Development Corporation Government of Tamil Nadu to train the self-help group members, women self-help group members, uh, to, uh, to train them also. We have taken as a pilot of uh, training seven districts. And uh, in that, actually, the, there will be screening and also there will be mild interventions. And also, they refer them if they have to refer them to the nearest mental health facility. Next slide, please. Yeah. 
Silver Groom Trainers Corp, along with that, uh, you know, uh, Tamil Nadu Women Development Corporation, you can see this woman with fight mental illness on the way, and with the map, and also with an app. You know, they have actually, there is an app that has been developed, you know, the screen. In fact, Tamil Nadu government has added our app into that, actually, you know, where, wherever they go to the field, they're doing a field activity. Uh, they, they, while doing that activity of women, they can also take the uh, information about mental health condition also. There is a small screening tool has been added in that, and they are all actually learned, and then they're, and they're doing it also. Next slide, please. Yeah, so mobile daily psychiatry, I'm sure some of you may know knowing about it. And we are trying to see that actually where is unreached. So we are trying to reach the unreached people through many innovative methods. We, we're trying to see that now, actually, in fact, we are now trying only for the past two, uh, two years plus only this is like a tele, a tele mobile, mobile daily psychiatry and all these things. But in fact, after tsunami, actually, we tried this. In fact, mobile daily psychiatry is one of our uh, art cake, and we have been one of the innovative method of scarves also reaching the unreached in the rural areas. Next. Yeah, so awareness programs being conducted in the rural areas, as I told you, the first day is missing, and wherever we are passing, I can see also that last slide, uh, last photograph where actually the woman is going and addressing the uh, Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme employees who are working in the uh, rural areas. So thank you for these slides. And uh, the last point which I want to tell us, which I emphasized in the beginning, Ashla. So we must have that centralized system which can give the guidelines and also advice and the resources also should be actually the both the knowledge as well as resources should be shared with the, all the states not only in the one, one particular state or resources where the resources are very high is there for example Tamil Nadu I always tell though we say that we are number one but still there are a lot of gaps are there so what will happen to the uh, districts or states which does not have a psychiatrist or mental health facility Okay, that too, especially the uh, women with mental health issues have been actually uh, taken the last seat. Thank you very much for the organizers for giving me the opportunity. Any question, I'll be happy to answer to you. Thank you, Dr. Koteshwar Rao, for bringing this whole question of wandering mentally ill persons. We as yeah. citizens also, so many times we have to intervene when the police brutally pitch them up, either at the bus stop or in the railway station or public places. So it's a very important uh, example which Tamil Nadu has given in terms of best practices and especially the new consciousness and the proactive approach of the state in a post-tsunami period because we have many friends who were involved in a rehabilitation program of uh, at the time of tsunami and the uh, whole anguish of women and children who face the difficult circumstances and how the state responded. Uh, now I come to uh, Ms. Varudini Kankipati, uh, who is working with Interconnect and I would like uh, uh, in Telangana. And we would like to know that what has been the role of counseling and in what way it can uh, bring better future for people suffering from various types of mental uh, concerns and mentally, mental health issues, as well as the mental illness. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Professor, and thank you, everyone. Um, this has been so enlightening. Um, I'm waiting to get my hands on the book, uh, Professor, so that I can also read it. Um, the one thing that I have noticed in practice, even with the team of uh, therapists that we work on, on field with uh, people in counseling. Women in particular, the thing that we, what we generally as a stereotype pass on is that women are emotional. So with that stereotype of women are anyway emotional, it sometimes takes away women's real call for help when they know that they are you know, struggling with something. Okay, don't be emotional. And the biggest thing is that a lot of people understand mental health or when it gets to mental illnesses, as a, that that's the severest form. But the symptoms in the beginning when it starts and when they come for therapy, the biggest thing that nobody really gets an understanding is that working on oneself in terms of their mental health is not easy. It's not like, okay, I have to eat certain foods and I will feel better if I have lack of nutrition. But when it comes to mental health, the strength it takes to say I need to get help is profound. Second is once they come in, 
it's not as easy as coming in for counseling and saying, okay, I will do this, 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 because it's not that simple. If they could do half of that things, they would have done it to begin with. So treatment or counseling, people feel like that should be easy. Okay, now you've got the tools, now you do it. But mental health doesn't work that way. It, it's really hard to start getting and making changes for yourself. And this is something that a lot of people have a misconception about. So the first thing with women I noticed is that one, when women are facing certain emotional ups and downs, they get disregarded because they're anyway stereotyped to say that you're too emotional. You're taking it thing. The second part is there's um, a contradiction in terms of uh, how people think that, you know, we are very modern, we are allowing women to go work, but we are not okay with the second part, which is that if women, if women are working, they have some empowerment that we don't want. <laughs> you know, we allow her to go work, but the empowerment that comes with it, her need to get additional help is not seen. And the one thing that we've noticed over the last two years is women who work and during the pandemic, the reason for domestic violence being high, reason that depression and anxiety going high amongst women is predominantly when the pandemic hit and all the families are staying together, the woman's role did not change at all. She's now the caretaker. The, uh, she has to work, she has to clean, she needs to cook, she needs to make the children study, she needs to look after herself, she needs to look after extended family, her husband. It's just not humanly possible it's, uh, to do all of that. So the one thing that I have noticed with the clients I'm seeing, women in particular, is that they're exhausted. They are so mentally exhausted. And that I think not only uh, from rural, all women, if you've noticed, women tend to take time at night because that's their me time when everyone's fallen asleep. Oh gosh, okay, let me get 45 minutes to one hour just to be for myself. And what do they do? At that point, they probably will binge watch on something. Again, on what cost? Their own sleep time cost. So now they're lacking sleep, they're lacking their me time. They have to be pulled in all direction because basic functionality of a family is driven by her. If she doesn't do it, nobody will do it. So I think in counseling, what we have been noticing is that there is no escape for women in terms of delegating or having people cooperate, especially, with her mental health deteriorating to the point that she cannot do anything and then they come for counseling, that time family members will then understand, okay, we have to help. But till then, it is assumed that the woman would do it. So this is one thing that we have been noticing as, uh, as a practitioner working with all of these women. What that, has been your experience of gaslighting by the oh, family members? Plenty. Plenty. When it comes to gaslighting, it, it is a power tool, right? So gaslighting is a chosen weapon that you want to say without having say, saying it on their face, right? Like just keeping quiet about it, not doing anything about it. Now, gaslighting is, is a form of retaliation, but it's a very passive aggressive way of doing it to make the woman feel like she's losing her mind. Right. So there are different, different uh, weapons of choice to do that. And uh, the one thing that um, uh, that I find predominantly that's going on with women is that it, it's, it's a contradiction. Even women, they have lost their ability to put themselves first. That's a big thing, because for them, Oh, if my health is looked after, what about my kids? If, take the example of domestic violence. We have seen world over domestic violence going higher, right? But domestic violence going higher is not only in women who are not working, it's even with women who are working. 
where she is making um, money. Uh, she has a status in society. Why is she going through that? Because it's not that. It doesn't determine on that. For women, she does not want to be the cause of breaking her family. Predominantly, she does not mind her not looking after herself as long as her family is intact which means that slowly and periodically her concept of self starts to break slowly because it's the family first so oh my gosh i can just go on and on just on each yeah. topic yeah. but um thank you for giving me this um opportunity and um Dr. Anand, I'm waiting to hold uh, my hand on your book and be able to read it and uh, put it in also my teaching with different universities. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. So thank you so much for having me on this. Thank you, Vardhi. Now, I think our last uh, discussion, Dr. M. Manjula, who is a clinical psychologist and she's in the Department of Clinical Psychology of Nimhas. I would like to know from her that what are the best practices and in what way uh, the reflection has taken place right from the biomedical approach and uh, electroconvulsive therapy. I think no, but none of you have spoken on electroconvulsive therapy, which has been, again, there is a resurgence of interest over the last 10 years. I hear from the municipal hospitals and all, usko electric ka shock diya aur wo bhi abhi jada bolta nahi hai. So that kind of approach. So I would like to know, Dr. Manjula, uh, Thank the you. best Thank practices you. in the current state of the art in psychiatry and psychological intervention. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Professor Vibhita Patel and uh, Impri for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, also, I would like to congratulate Dr. Meenu for the very, very comprehensive book. Uh, I am not a psychiatrist, so I'm a clinical psychologist. So I'll be talking from the clinical psychology perspective. So I'm saying that uh, I will not be talking about ECT and uh, Dr. Mathesh Pandey will be a better person to talk about ECT. So um, I'll be mainly talking about the gaps because uh, all the previous panelists, they have uh, beautifully discussed the interaction of uh, biopsychosocial factors. So this is something that we keep in mind when we try to understand any uh, mental health problem whether it is like you no know, in in any gender context but then what what i see is that that the each gender comes with their own set of vulnerabilities so and and then like you no know, that uh, like uh, the others have already highlighted there are these weaker genders and then they are always much more vulnerable than maybe you know some other gender which which is little slightly more uh, empowered and you know that uh, privileged and all that so there is always a discrepancy in terms of the the whether we pay a lot of attention to although we understand that all these biopsychosocial factors play an important role and the vulnerability set of vulnerabilities are much more in a particular gender for example in women but uh, when we do the assessment when we see the clients or the you know the patients do we keep all those things in mind when we are assessing them say for example child sexual abuse or or physical abuse or or any kind of childhood adverse experiences that they would have had so do we pay attention to them i think that is something like you know that uh, i'm I, I i don't think like we pay a lot of attention like we are uh, especially we are not so much trained to look at all those things although we know but then are we sensitive to pick up all those things is it that we are also influenced by the by the socio cultural factors that we are brought up from from the background that we come from so i think this is one of the gap that that i can identify although we know we may not be sensitive to you know pay attention to those things that is the first point that i would like to make the second point would be like like others have mentioned there are lot of discrepancies in terms of identifying mental health issues treatment like giving them treatment as well as looking at the compliance whether they are taking medication or not or whether they are afford like whether they have access to all these interventions that are there whether it is medical or psychological interventions the access also there is a lot of difference whether they can access or no and then gender sensitive treatment like you know that are they say for example are we sensitive to expression of symptoms like it, it is different in males it is different in females like are we sensitive to identify that and and maybe like you know that 
uh, tailor make those intervention accordingly because uh, help seeking itself may be poor no that that sometimes it is may, men who do not uh, seek help sometimes it is women because because the accessibility and then the support that they have importance that is given to them to seek help so they may not seek help so do we address those issues and um, like i said it is applicable for both drugs drug treatment as well as psychotherapy uh, and also like whether it is uh, it is uh, enough researched in terms of uh, in terms of psychotherapies do we consider all minor genders into consideration when we are uh, when we are formulating psychotherapies that is another important thing that has to be kept in mind training research as well as practice so all these three things i think there there is lot of gaps in terms of equal representation and giving importance and uh, the third point that i would like to highlight is that the gender role stereotypes how much are we influenced in in terms of the therapist client relationship so does it influence that like you know that when when i am seeing a male patient versus i am when i am seeing a female patient does it influence my views in terms of how do i expect what do i expect and and then how do i understand their problems is it like are we devoid of that kind of an influence is the is the training actually making us look at those kind of things is something which i feel that it's a, it, there is a gap in terms of that and also like matching the therapist and the client in terms of the therapy the kind of the therapies and the kind of the issues is it that for, for certain kinds of issues gender matching has to be there for certain kind of issues any gender is okay so so we don't have much information on that okay and also like gender based transference and counter transference like those issues is something which i feel that that needs a lot of you no know, research as well as clinical application and um, the cultural influences on the therapy itself is something which needs to be you know looked at uh similarly like you no know, gender affirmative therapies and like you know that i don't think lot of work like there there is work but then like there is lot of work still needs to be done so so whether we have to consider that, to take into consideration the multicultural kind of models and apply it for everybody or is it that we'll have to look at the socio cultural models like which is which are specific because within india there are lot of differences like dr koteshwar rao was giving example like you know that we we i don't know like are we prepared for so much of diversity and are we sensitive to identify all those factors and then be you know open to uh, incorporating them when we are uh, seeing you know um, patients or clients in in therapy thank you thank you for providing clinical psychologist perspective now i think we come to the uh, q and a session or, or first there are some, uh, quite a few questions uh, in the <clears throat> question box as well as in the chat box there have been responses by the participants so first one is that the pandemic had pushed young girls again in the clutches of patriarchal setting to increase visibility at their homes as due to closure of their educational institutions as well as workplaces what can be the solution to guard them guard their mental health challenges they faced post covid who would like to take this question yeah varudini would you like to respond as a counselor haru Yes, sure. So I think that one of the things that women need to do is, um, since they've gone through this year and a half from schools to, uh, it has to be taught that in a family, everyone's a contributing factor to running a family, and that needs to be taught from schools. And women have a role to distribute division of work in the family as well. and she needs a structure she needs to put a structure in place and that will help the family members to know that nobody is taken for granted in terms of running a family and that no one person is responsible for the food on the table or the clothes being done laundry being done that that is so that's number 1 so i feel that it starts at the basic level of educating from children 
to, um, because if you've noticed, if you tell children in schools, you know, you need to help your mom, you need to do this, the teacher's word is almost word of God for younger children, not when they come in there. But that can help, that can start making them think that, oh, okay, I am a family member, which means I'm a contributing member. So I would think that there's both sides from children to um, women putting a structure and a structure will help everyone know. It's a double double meaning. I mean, in sense that she's not only getting help, but it also starts to help everyone with the mindset that everyone needs to contribute. There is also a question of intersectionality because this year, uh, within one year, National Commission for Women and all the helplines, Childline 1098, 180, 4,25,000 children have made distress call out of which 25% were by adolescent girls. Yeah. And one crore girl are already they are out of school and there are forced marriage, forced this. So I think the the their problems are even much more than yeah. this. And, and that's why it requires it, it gains the enormity and especially right. we have to take them very seriously. Absolutely. Yeah. Second question is by Satyashri Goswami from TISS. She asks, does the book cover mental health issues of trans persons and gender non-binary persons? Uh, Dr. Minu Anand, would you like to answer this? There is, uh, no, uh, there is no separate chapter on the theme. However, this uh, issue has been discussed across most chapters. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. The third question is that what is the role of gender in indigenous mental health therapy versus uh, secular global conception of mental health? Who would like to answer? Dr. Deshpande? Well, actually, I wanted to talk about uh, the ECT that you, ECT yeah. issue that you had raised. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. I think, yeah, you speak about it. Then we'll come to... I so, think we'll in spite of all the, uh, you know, uh, emphasis that has been placed on ECT down the ages, at least within the last two to three decades, ECT has gradually lost its place in the treatment of mental illnesses, except in, you know, there are, uh, see, uh, psychiatrists just, uh, just like other doctors are a spectrum. So there would be some who would be practicing it fairly frequently. But at least as far as modern psychiatrists go, it, ECT has taken a very, very, very backward seat. Even more than that, there are so many legal requirements now under the Mental Health Care Act 2017. First of all, it has been completely banned across the board for children. It has been banned uh, without proper anesthesia. That means you need a proper operation theater at least. So all with all these advances, First of all, ECT is given to a, a minority or even a minuscule minority of patients, uh, hopefully only those who need it, and hopefully only in the bigger institutions where check, checks and balances are in better place. And I have not come across any literature which says that uh, ECT is the preferred treatment for women as opposed to men. Mm, I don't think that happens. Yeah. Okay, but I think basically it is the Hollywood and Bollywood. Uh, they also show such horrible scenes. Yes, because Bollywood actually is uh, absolutely horrendous. They have no consideration for reality. Uh, they do not uh, even consult experts. And as far as their mental health knowledge is concerned, I think social workers should come up in arms against it. I think that's the reason even when they're genuine, people just shun no, to go to the psychiatrist or psychiatrist. No, in spite of that, madam, at least at Ramano Lumia Hospital, there has been a five to ten percent increase every year in uh, the people who attend uh, psychiatry OPD. Whereas the services that are being offered, or the faculty, or the um, uh, you know professionals who are there, are the same as they were, you know, in uh, the late nineties. So <laughs> there's a huge strain on all government uh, services. And that is something that is never ever highlighted by anybody outside the service. And therefore, it becomes like a, a, a vicious circle. Yeah. That it is the, the mental health professionals who want more mental health professionals. There must be a hidden agenda. There must be something selfish and so on and so forth. It's yeah. not like that. Because we cannot give counseling to everybody who needs it. There simply are not 
that many people around so what you talked about group counseling or community counseling is very very relevant to not only to india but to all uh, you know developed countries even consciousness raising yeah that's yes true. just to yes. add to that point yeah. i think in india uh, just to add to it that in india counselors or therapist a lot of them call themselves counselor and therapist even with the three month diploma there's a huge yes, yes. difference of uh, and it's not licensed in india and this is something i feel i'm very much advocating that there needs to be a licensing board for counselors so that we know that they have the basic knowledge and treatment for mental health and what really counseling is providing ethical standards of counseling services for people okay. um that needs to be very much highlighted yeah correct i i just would, i just would like to add uh, the, yeah. the code of this thing licensing and all because tamil nadu also as per the new mental health care act a lot of debate is going on now so who is counselor now as one most person said as the chair person said the counseling rate is too high you know the one is the cost and first of all the second is the uh, qualification the new mental health care act tells us the old uh, uh, this thing school of thought and school like uh, uh, courses should be abolished and they must have some licensing this thing so in fact tamil nadu government chairman authority actually we are trying to uh, formalize people people are people already is 50 plus years and i don't know whether they will go for any exams now and go for any uh, test for this uh, you know so at the same time actually you know by say, say by keeping their uh, experience in their my this thing and also kind of quality of uh, quality as there some kind of minimal uh, test has to be performed has to be taken no they have to take the test and then get that uh, this thing that uh, but for the experience sake we would like to give that some marks for that and also uh, we are we are actually three sets of uh, suggestion we have given to government of tamil nadu now from the state mental authority so there is also issue in tamil nadu is going on now because earlier it was there even during tsunami also everyone going and calling them just talking to them for 5 minutes they calling themselves as a counselor okay one way actually people making money lot of money also one way so and uh, the uh, finally the, the grassroots level person from the uh, rural people person is not getting the quality service mm-hmm. or, or exactly this quality service no doubt about that so we can able to do that in fact as in tamil nadu and for the statement authority and also uh, scarf india also uh, signed an moe with the uh, uh, tamil nadu women development corporation where we are training the self help group women on mental health and also counseling so we are not that actually we are telling us these are the replacement of uh, any psychologists or social workers but at the same time i don't know even after 50 years we are not going to reach the gap what we have the professionals now so to reduce the gap and also to do the first aid at least the, uh, to reduce you know a lot of suicides are also happening in the rural areas and also in the urban areas to reduce the gap we are trying to get, use these community level workers to identify that and also do basic things and then refer to the psychiatrist or mental health profession nearby is available so that's i just wanted to add from uh, from scarf perspective scarf's role in um, uh, community mental health counseling which we are training the community level workers and also there is a issue in uh, state mental authority also no about this uh, uh, legalization of these people uh, certification for these people who are already has got uh, social work uh, so uh, psychology uh, uh, because clinical psychology is now accepted as per the new uh, mental health care act 2017 the yeah. people who are there finished it before that and people, people uh, finished apart from ranchi as well as from nimhan they are not touched allowed yeah but in the new mental health care act yeah okay oh. yeah i think uh, uh, dr sujatha jawan she is uh, she has responded to dr koteshwar rao uh, she was a family counselor uh, counselor in the family court of mumbai more than two decades she worked she retired also as a counselor and she says she totally agrees uh, for the license for practicing counselor now the uh, another very important question is about the please throw some light on the difference between mental illness and mental disease uh niti is asking this yeah yes vibhuti ma'am just because yeah. we were also discussing about uh, community counseling yeah. uh, many of our institution be it university or corporate there is also counseling and as as uh, professor smita was highlighting there is now acute demand and supply problem hovering around especially pertaining to manpower uh, yeah. in this area ma'am how do you see the institutional uh, counseling a setup which has been done over decades i was in jnu uh, in jnu also have you know the uh, the the counselors and uh, 
uh, there are a lot of because the researchers go a lot and now especially in this pandemic this is really required how do you see this setup also evolving especially in the post pandemic uh, uh, period uh, all the panelists whomsoever wanted to take this can take vibhuti ma'am would you like to add some more questions so that we can i just want to add one question is about that uh, many many progressive schools no they have now created a post of counselor so i think we need to make representation to the uh, board uh, school boards in various states as well as uh, uh, in the university grants commission to create a post of counselor in the uh, educational institution so that is very important i think even the employers in the corporate world also i think we should say the level of stress that people are facing uh, the, uh, with that i think they should also create a post in the hr department they have a human resource uh, department hr department in that they should also create a post of counselor so in the budget you have to uh, make provision for salaries no? that is one i would like to add one point that uh, post covid what is happening for counseling services i think uh, the, it has increased in terms of the people approaching the psychologists it is increased i think many folds compared to uh, before covid period because of the tele counseling services that are available now so many psychologists are offering the tele counseling tele psychotherapy services and the people it is becoming easy for them to it is it is no more institutionalized like, like you no know? earlier i think it is much more now uh, more avenues and opportunities are there because they need not come to the institute or a hospital they can just approach the uh, therapist and then they get the you know uh, sessions but then the problem like others mentioned the licensing is one of the big problems that in india that has to be you know streamlined uh, to a large extent maybe the allied healthcare you know bill is something which is a promise for the counselors and you know the other people with masters and uh, other specialization courses and para all that para counselors yeah you know, psychologists also it, it is there like psychologists and social workers and people who work in general hospital settings they are all included in that but the implementation part we are not very clear about that how mm-hmm. it is yeah may i jump in uh, to answer that question madam yes about the role of gender in indigenous mental health therapy yeah the I, to my knowledge there are hundreds and diff, uh, dozens of indigenous medical uh, therapies and medicines i am not sure if they have any kind of module about counseling because i at least the two dominant therapies of uh, yoga and uh, ayurveda do not have any uh, specific counseling methods or anything like that of course that said i am not an indigenous medicine uh, practitioner so i can't really tell you there is also some please throw some light on the difference between mental illness and mental disease i don't think that's a uh, you know that's a very um, hard and fast uh, kind of a thing if they are interchangeable terms yes. and in fact we prefer to use the word mental disorder because disease implies that there is something that is known the etiology at least the causative factor is known and hopefully the way to control it and the the uh, you know the way to treat it uh, preferably with some modern medical interventions is known thank you dr dishpande there are two responses one by usha uh, jos uh, who says that well said koteshwara rao we need license please bring out uh, it as soon as possible we have human resources why can't we utilize it during this pandemic period uh, another response is that of uh, satyashri goswami who says that along with creating counselors the stigma of accessing these services have to be addressed through appropriate awareness programs in corporates and uh, schools so i think that is a very yeah that is very important uh, point and i think the challenge that we are facing currently is the stigma is a very very important concern which yeah. is- also let me add that the stigma is also very different for young and old people so yeah. if our That's panelist right. do no, that that's and, very true yes very if our panelist can also add yes yeah yeah so rajini ma'am would you like to uh, uh, yes. um, elaborate upon it very very yeah. right uh, in terms of how uh, the younger generation are looking at mental health they are very very clear that their mental health is important that they want to 
look after it, they understand it, and um, they're the ones educating or even telling what mental disorders they have to their parents, even before they come to the counselors themselves. So um, there's that much of information out there. Um, yeah. And also the fact that because there's a counselor in most schools available, children are already, there's so many generations of children who are aware of the word counselors and who that person is and what that role of the counselor is. Whereas, you know, the parents' generation or take 20, 30 years back, they had no understanding. So there's definitely a different, um, uh, different take on understanding of what uh, counseling and therapy is in terms of mental health. But that being said, I have noticed that a lot of parents, older generation, feel that counseling is about advice giving. They don't understand that it's a process of personal growth. So there's still that miscommunication, thinking that the counselor is there to guide the child in what to do right and wrong and advice giving. So that's still a myth and it's still very persistent because I still have parents calling me, telling me, can you please talk to my daughter and tell her not to do this because they think that's my role. Mm -hmm. So um, definitely there's a different view, but I feel like in a couple of, especially this pandemic, which has huge advocacy in mental health form, it's really going to um, up the game in terms of most people in India, in US or take Western countries, they're way ahead in understanding really what counseling, even clinical psycho, the difference between a clinical psychologist, a psychologist and a psychiatrist is they're very clear. In India, it's very mixed. So we still have a long way uh, in terms of understanding what these three roles are in mental health. Important. Yeah, yeah, very important insight. Uh, now, there is a response from Gunjan. Ayush Ministry has recently been venturing in amalgamating psychology and the traditional health systems. What would be the uh, like uh, response of the society to this kind of uh, amalgamation? I think, uh, can Dr. Koteshwara, who works with the Tamil Nadu government, throw light that uh, such experiments have been made in Tamil Nadu. And then I think Dr. Deshpande can also enlighten us. Hello. Sorry, there I, is a lot. Yeah. Yes, madam. So there is a lot of discussions going on, but uh, all these uh, allopathy doctors are against that. Yeah. And they are all protesting for that. Yeah. And the government now, actually, while the people who are protested already, the government has asked to give note why you are protesting. And because they want to listen to both sides. Correct. And people who also who are there in the Harish actually is not fully trained on this. And whether you uh, don't know how much they're going to do, do the damage also. So we must have some checkpoints before we are allowing them to do it. That is one side of people who are uh, supporting Ayush is also telling that we must have that. So there is actually uh, two sets of things are going on. Still not taking any final many decision on this, madam. Once it's taken, definitely I will share with the group too. But sir, uh, this whole music therapy and color therapy and fragrance therapy and all, is it integrated in the healing practices of the mainstream? Yes, very much is there. Very much is there. But it is there only, but see, where is the manpower you have? Where that is the manpower? That's, 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 that's the, the most important question now. Yeah. See, here, 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 you also just know, earlier speaker also spoke actually, almost all schools have got a school uh, counselor. Yes, I appreciate that. That is only there. That is only there in the private schools. Yeah. You believe me or not, almost 25 schools in Chennai City approached me to be the counselor for the schools. Okay. Here also. Okay. They, just want to, they just want our CV in there, this thing, as to show that actually, as a counselor is there in the school or not. So, hardly I may get six days, six months, one, one, per, one person to my listing cleaning, that's all. Or I will be listing them once in six months like that. But I will be getting a payment. But no, one, most of the NGOs I'm, I'm, are also I'm, functioning only with the help of interns, those who are doing MA psychology or this thing. No, they are, they have to depend on uh, they none of them have a full time counselor. Yeah, exactly. only and with second, the interns. Very, yeah. Second very important thing is what will happen to the people who are there in the government schools. Very very important people they are. Yeah. In what government school teachers are should be actually given a lot of awards because where there is no, if you don't get seats in the private schools, finally there will be destination will be the government schools. Yeah. People who get mild retardation and also having uh, behavioral issues, all the children 
definitely required almost one school definitely required five psychologists and five therapists required such schools are com completely ignored in fact the new uh, this thing we have requested the government to uh, employ uh, full time social uh, social workers or psychologists in the government schools also to take care of these mental health issues among these kids too yeah who studying in the government schools yeah so that takes care of madhusmita's madhusmita's question why psychologists and counselors are kept as contractual always and i think that's what we are demanding that there should be a regular post to be created in the institutions yes. so very now right. i know um, um, yes ma'am yeah. yes as smaller towns and district headquarters we can just imagine when we are discussing about metropolitan there are some question uh, which has come on facebook live i will just quickly read them Uh, Arvindar and Sari Ma'am saying it's wonderful presentation. Sunita Dhar Ma'am also. Ah, uh, Preeta Jha Ma'am is asking a lot of question. One of that is very useful to get this perspective. Could you tell us little about available resources for NGOs to start working on these issues, and also how to tackle the problem of very problematic conception of counselling within our culture? I think we have uh, uh, covered it. rather than the person being counseled i see this particularly romantic adolescent sexuality cases where the adolescents are not so much counseled as pushed in a certain direction counseling is done with a target objective set by, by the counselors uh, so uh, very different set of questions of technical also i am sure you all must have uh, so ma'am uh, your views or dr yeah. rao dr meenu uh, now you have to like give your concluding remarks keeping into consideration all the questions deliberations in chat box and question box and uh, the uh, responses of the discussants yes over to dr yeah. it has been uh, a wonderful and engaging the session with the uh, esteemed panelists and uh, some of the students i can recognize my research scholars as well i can see and some of the eminent personalities from academia as well as the field so i'm really grateful to everybody for so much support and i will conclude uh, with one poem ma'am if you allow me yeah uh, this is a poem on resilience by uh, alex elie and uh, it says uh, look at you still standing after being knocked out and thrown out look at you still growing after being picked and plucked and prodded out of your home look at you still dancing and singing after being defeated and disassembled look at you love still there and hopeful after it all so i just want to say that uh, uh, let's try to attain our power and uh, from where our wounds have come and i think that we need to begin with ourselves our own families before we venture out and help or seek help from others around us personally or professionally and thank you so much uh, professor patel dr arjun esteem panelists wonderful participants thank you so much for so much love so much support so much encouragement yeah so thank you dr meenu anand for putting it so beautifully which touched our head and heart both uh, i would like to conclude that by saying that today we have come to a consensus that it is important to go beyond documenting sex sex differences in the rates of mental and neurological disorders there is a need to examine how gender differences impact risk and vulnerabilities of different genders their access to health services and their socio and economic consequences of mental illness their dignity their identity self perception and self esteem in different settings in different social groups at uh, di different age groups and also at different points in their life cycle world health organization has advised nation states to focus on operations uh, research to identify factors that facilitate dealing with distress results uh, should be applied to design suitable intervention programs especially at the community and primary care level more research is needed on how the gender differences interact with differences in women's and men's and third genders reproductive biology to influence uh, mental disorders and how this modify the effects of different pharmacological and psychological treatment the most systematic evidence is needed on how the mental health consequences of intimate partner violence uh, as uh, it uh, the it is declared that 
uh, it has now become a shadow pandemic and uh, the sexual abuse in women and also men can be addressed especially in settings where resources are scarce and social norms condone this type of sexual violence uh, why are we what are the implications for mental health policies and programs on marginalized communities what are the learnings of traditional healing practices can we build bridges between the locally rooted healers and the modern medical practitioners uh, mental health policies and programs should incorporate an understanding of gender issues in each context and uh, be developed in consultation with women men transgender community from the family uh, communities families service providers from various streams of healers and service users uh, gender based barriers to accessing uh, mental health care need to be addressed in program planning and also in a public discourse we we need to bring it primary health care and maternal health care services are also responsive to the we have to make them responsive to psychological issues and are they they have to be sensitive to gender differences uh, and and they need to provide the cost effective mental health services in this context we may uh, it is important to promote the concept of meaningful assistance as who has called it uh, for mental health care needs including psychological counseling support to cope better in difficult life situations and uh, not just prescription of drugs an antidote to commercialization of mental health services and counseling have to be by the by the vested interest uh, which is strengthening uh, as against that we need to strengthen the community based mental health intervention provision of community based care for chronic mental disorders should be organized to ensure that facilities meet the specific needs of women and men boys and girls people of uh, different uh, uh, transgender community and uh, those who are sexual minorities and the burden of caring doesn't should not fall disproportionately on women uh, like dr meenu anand i had also decided to end with my favorite poem uh the i will buy marsha forest and uh, this is uh, after the excellent book discussion i think this would be the most important learning that we have and uh, as these verses uh tell us inclusion is a trend such as democracy freedom and justice for all all means all no buts about it inclusion is opposite of exclusion inclusion is no to boycott inclusion is battle cry challenge to the parents child's cry for his or her existence for welcome for embrace to be remembered fondly for award for gift of love like surprise like treasure inclusion means clean game general knowledge courtesy hard work inclusion is great in its simplicity and surprising in its complexity instead of investing in jails mental asylums hospitals refugee camps to channelize the resources for creating true homes true life true human beings for humanizing life so with this uh, i would like to say that today's experience was extremely educative and inspiring all of us were on the same level of sensitivity and sensibility we did not know each other personally and still we, it came out so beautifully the way we gel with each other in our discussion so i thank dr smita deshpande dr mahapatra dr koshta koteshwar rao varudini professor nilima uh, uh, shivastava and uh, dr meenu anand who has been the utsav murthy in marathi we call them utsav murthy uh, because of that we all are here and also the participants who have kept the discussion very live both in chat box as well as by asking very very important questions uh, now i request dr arjun kumar to give the vote of thanks thank you madam yeah thank you thank you everyone so uh, anshula will quickly give the vote of thanks anshula are you ready yes uh, thank you um Yes, I think Vibhuti Ma'am really has covered it. But once again, formally, on behalf of the IMPRI Gender Impact Study Center, I, Anshula Mehta, Senior Assistant Director at IMPRI, uh, would like to thank all of you for joining today's pertinent and very enriching discussion on gender and mental health. I would like, like to thank our chair for today, Professor Vibhuti Patel, uh, our speaker, Dr. Meenu Anand, and all uh, our discussants, the panelists, for sharing their insights and um, for such an education. 
educational discussion. Uh, 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 Dr. M. Manjula, um, sorry, Dr. M. Manjula, Professor Neelima Shivastava, Dr. Varudhini uh, Kankipati, um, Professor Smita Desh Pandey, Dr. Ananya Mahapatra, and Dr. Koteshwara Rao. Thank you so much for taking out your time to join this uh, discussion. And uh, yes, thank you to all the participants who tuned in here on Zoom or on Facebook Live and raised very important questions uh, to enrich the discussion. Thank you, everyone. And we hope you uh, tune into our future episodes of Gender Gaps as well. And good night. Thank you. Thank you. Take care thank you. and have a good night. Thank you, thank thank you. you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now, it's so nice being in your company, huh? Dr. Deshpande, Dr. Koteshwar Rao, Varadini. And mm -hmm. I have it's a pleasure that. meeting all of you and yeah. talking. And I'm so passionate uh, about it. Thank <laughs> you. So, I had read your, their chapters, but now uh, meeting them in person really makes Yes, it's nice. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Good thank evening. Thank you. Thank we'll you. keep it time. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Have a very, very educative discussion. I'll share the videos over WhatsApp. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Excellent.